welcome to the second annual IOOF Cemetery Tour. Um, we're, it's sponsored by the genealogy section of the uh, Fulton County Historical Society. And we help people discover facts about their ancestry. And if you'd like to join us, we have information on the table uh, where you can join our, our group. Members receive our newsletter, the Folk Finder, which are for sale at the table when you came in. And if you like to do your genealogy research, uh, search, please come to the um, Fulton County Museum north of town, and they'd be glad to help you with that. I'm Caroline Jones, and I'll be your tour guide today. This cemetery tour is part of our mission to bring um, history alive in Fulton County. And it was so much fun last year, we decided to do it again. And this year we have four more people who are really interesting and led interesting lives. They also uh, were mainly pioneers who helped shape our community. This cemetery was founded by the Rochester chapter of the International Order of Odd Fellows in 1853. And it's been in continuous use since then. And we'd like to thank the trustees of the lodge and also the people that work here because without them, we couldn't have had this tour. So uh, we also would like to recognize the Sturgeon family. How many of you here are with the Sturgeon family? Okay. From all over the country. What, what are some of the states where you live? Missouri. Missouri? Kentucky. Kentucky. Florida. Florida? Indiana. Indiana? Okay. Well, from what I understand, the Sturgeons were pioneer families in Fulton County. Is that right? Yes. And you had a town that was named after you? Yes. Okay. And you're having your annual meeting here this weekend in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm glad you could join us. So anyway, we're going to walk slowly over to the first grave. <laughs> and because uh, I know some of you walk a little slow, slower than others, and that's okay. Just take your time. When we get over there, then we'll have um, the first person to talk about his great, great grandfather. So off we go. Okay, I think we have everybody. Um, our first stop is Mr. Obert O.B. Goss. And he's portrayed today by his great grandson which is really cool. This is Graham Goss. Hi, everyone. So I'm not sure how many of you guys know of a small little company known as Coca-Cola, but in Indiana, it's kind of its roots started here in Rochester, Indiana. The f not the first ever, but one of the first bottling co uh, companies started here in Rochester, Indiana by myself, over at Goss. Originally, I ran, I ran a butcher shop in the Henry, Henry Township Village, and I lived just north of Athens. But in 1917, I decided to move to Rochester because I really wanted to get into the ice cream business. So I started manufacturing and selling my very own ice cream. Eventually, I also began to start bottling and producing sodas, or pop, or soda pop, whatever you would like to call it. Coke soon announced that they would begin franchising. They would begin allowing people to come and get syrup and start bottling their very own Coca-Cola products. I was so interested in Coke and selling their product that I drove all the way down to Atlanta, Georgia in order to obtain my own syrup and to come back to Rochester and begin producing my own Coke. I purchased my, I know, my own bottling company building and began to produce my own Coke. This building is 515 on Main Street. It's just north of uh, the Evergreen Cafe right now. So in 1923, bottling began right here in Rochester, Indiana, and we became very, very popular. We were known for our own ice cream, for our own Coke, and everyone would come down and have our own. It was so popular that you begin to see pints of ice cream containers laying all over the ground, and every night it had to be all swept up. But it began to become a huge problem in the town. <laughs> Eventually, I stopped making my own ice cream, but I continued to sell and produce it because it was so popular with the Coke. But as I continued to bottle Coke, I began to make my own kind of flavors, one known as Cherry Bloom. It was very, very popular. In 1925, my bottling factory was running at the 100%, but only four short years later, it soon disintegrated. 
no one was quite sure why, and even I'm not quite sure. It just soon disintegrated and was gone for, in four short years. The building was sold and it was no more. However, my family collected so much coke memorabilia that we were notorious for going out and just burying it because we just had too much and had to get rid of it. If we had kept it today, we'd probably be pretty rich. So that's my small life story of how I brought coke to Indiana. Thank you guys so much for listening. Coke so much, like it's my favorite thing. So you want a job? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. I just got the scars and everything <laughs> from doing all those things, and it was not easy work. It was probably done in my day the same way it was in Mr. Gross's day, where you grabbed all those bottles and in your fingers, and you had to do the manual labor and, the, and everything. Was Yes, I yeah I do have a bottle. It is it is not a Coke bottle, but it is a one of his um, bottles from when he was bottling everything. If you guys would like to come and see us. Grand, do yeah. you know where they were buried? Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, I I don't know exactly where, but um, he after uh, the bottling company shut down, he moved to Plymouth, and. It is said that there was a farm just north of Plymouth that he buried all of the Coke memorabilia. So if you guys want to go start digging, I'm not saying you probably should, but if you want to, feel free. Just let me know. So that's what he bottled the Coke in? Um, I, I think for the Coke, he had a, a different bottle that has Coca-Cola on it. But this is for like um, the Cherry Bloom, like something like that. He'd put something like this in there, in here. And so it has like, it says OS Goss. Um, it says OS Goss. Bottling works, uh, content, 56, it has like the amount, and then there's Rochester, Indiana on the bottom. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Hang on to that. Nice yeah. job. Yeah, let's go. Don't drop it. And just as a note, um, Graham graduated from Rochester High School in, this spring, and you're off to Purdue. Purdue. On Monday, he's going to Purdue, so thanks, Graham. And this this is Helen House Outkill, and she's portrayed today by Betty Martins. Oh, that's all? That's the whole intro I get? Oh, that's okay. all you get. All right. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Helen. It was so nice of all you to come today to, uh, like I said, see all the dead people. Uh, like Maria said last, last year, we don't get a lot of visitors. And especially considering when I died so long ago, actually um, 1954, which I just discovered as I walked up here, I remembered my father died the same year, which was uh, kind of an interesting coincidence. I'm going to put my lucky teddy bear down. I'll refer to him later. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming. I have my safety checkoff list here that I'm going to use to make sure I inform you of everything, just as I would when I go up in a plane. I have to do my safety checks. So just 11 years after the Wright brothers did their famous flight with their first fixed wing powered aircraft, I was born here in Rochester on June 29, 1914. My parents, Walter and Goldie, welcomed me to the world. And the story goes that as soon as they cut off my pigtails, I started to fly. Apparently, I loved flying from an, a very early age. And I got my pilot's license when I was only 19. And I was one of the few women in Indiana that had a pilot's license, even especially at that young age. I took my instruction from uh, a man in South Bend. And my uh, father obviously encouraged and supported my endeavors in this, which might have been kind of unusual back at that time for um, a dad to support his daughter that way. But he obviously believed in my abilities, and as soon as I got my license, he leased the airport grass strip from the city of Rochester to run. He and I ran it for years, and then when he stepped aside, my husband, Wayne, uh, who was a star athlete at Warsaw, and a great pa uh, mechanic and a pilot as well, he and I then leased it and ran it for many years. I referred to my lucky teddy bear, who I took on every flight with me, 
And uh, my favorite plane, I nicknamed Susabella. Uh, it, it, I cannot remember exactly where I got that name. It sounded Italian, but I'm not sure. Um, as I said before, I'm a real stickler for details. And even though the flight crew would tell me my plane was ready to go, I would go through everything again to make sure that it was everything was just exactly as it should be. And you'll see later on that this paid off because the airport later years became a very good standard for safety. As in my, any profession, it's always good to have those around you that can support your common interests. So women pilots saw a need to do this to provide mutual support, encourage the advancement of aviation, and to create a central office to keep files on women pilots. Thus, an organization which is still in existence today was founded in 1929 to do just that. All 117 women pilots from around the country, that would be roughly two per state, if you do the math real quick, were invited to this first meeting. However, only 99 were able to attend, thus the name 99ers. So their group was called the 99s, and um, one of our, our very first president, of course, in 1931, was probably the most famous woman pilot you've ever heard of, Amelia Earhart. And uh, all those 99 members were considered charter members of the organization. And she was in a great position, of course, to uh, promote women in all kinds of careers. And uh, especially when she was on staff down at Purdue, not far from here. And it was a real great shock, of course, when she disappeared trying to circumnavigate the globe in 1937. Very sad for all of us, especially the women pilots that she supported so well. My stat sheet. Oh my, check off this. Um, we had chapters throughout the country, and our Indiana chapter met in various cities, and the women, of course, would fly into the city. We had a meeting in March of 41 in South Bend, and several members flew up, and I was able to take one of my students, Martha Bright, and her mom. And um, I was hoping to run into some students today. Do I have any former students here today? Are you a former student? Oh, you didn't take lessons? Okay, all right. My, my dad was a student. Your dad was a student? Oh, and who are you? Larry Cunningham, and dad was Lauren Cunningham. And I just got to give you a hug. Oh, I got to give you a hug. <laughs> I loved you then. I was probably eight. I fell in love with you. <laughs> and I always came to the airport with dad. I said, I got to go see Helen. Oh. I don't know whether she rose or not recognized me. Well. But I got to tell you one story. Okay. We got a call. It had to be corn planting time, because uh -huh. dad normally would not leave the farm at corn planting time, <laughs> that they had an emergency to fly a patient to Mayo's. Oh. Dad came home, came in the field, we listened to the radio, and he said, I won't fly. The weather's too bad. They said, well, come over at the airport. So I went with him, and we came over, and the weather was terrible. Mm. They said, we got to get this patient to Mayo's. So they had a Beechcraft, beautiful plane, by wing probably six seats in the back. They took two seats out, put the stretcher in, had a nurse, and Dad said, well, I'll fly if Helen will co-pilot. <laughs> My dad had his uh, uh, instrument license mm -hmm. in the University of Illinois. So we take off, and we get over Lake Michigan, and you really didn't have to go to Kings Island for a thrill, because we were <laughs> up and down and everywhere. You couldn't see a thing. Oh. Absolutely, you had to reach for your nose. Oh. I was sitting in the seat just behind Helen, and I was kind of leaning forward, and I was right behind you. Oh, I, I, I couldn't believe it. And <laughs> I said something, and you slapped me so hard, I thought, Oh, dear. I was almost in tears. Oh, dear. And I thought, I thought you loved me. No. <laughs> oh, I did, Larry. I did. I just meant it out of kindness. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, we got back to Rochester, and uh, you said, come with me. So I went with you. You put your arm like this and said, no, come with me. We went out to the hangar and you had a Lynx trainer. Oh. And you put me in the Lynx trainer and you told me, and I said, you fly. See that bar right there? Mm -hmm. You keep that straight. Don't let that get, strap me in. I had shoulder straps and all that. Well, I was, you know, I was going to fly. Mm -hmm. right? And she pulled this curtain down over it. You couldn't see a thing. <laughs> Not a thing. I mean, you couldn't, and we had to reach. So I'm flying. I'm really, well, no, I'm really flying. Probably three minutes maybe and then she pulled the curtain back I'm upside down there you go, <laughs> and I'm, there I, you go. I thought well 
surely I'd know I was upside down <laughs> or that the dust would fall or something. Mm. And she flipped me over and we got out and there was a running board. We sat down. She sat down beside me. You said, you learn anything? And I kind of looked like, okay, let me tell you what the lesson is. When your dad's flying instruments, never question the instruments. <laughs> never. <laughs> never question, question the instruments. The instruments. Okay. I never questioned them when we would fly uh, through a storm or something. Uh -huh. That was a lesson that was very important. Mm -hmm. And she said, you didn't see that line flip? No. Yeah. What were you looking at? Well, I guess I was looking at everything else. You weren't. Pay attention <laughs> to the instruments. That's but yeah, right. so That's that right. was a great lesson. Okay. The okay. other thing I want to tell you, I have pictures of you in a wagon behind a lawnmower, and we would go down through the Rochester Parade. We had a lot of parades back then. Oh. I don't know whether it had the airport sign on the back of the wagon yeah. or not, uh -huh. but you were sitting in the wagon. I had this big lawnmower because I mowed out the airport, and we'd go through the parades, mm. and we did that several times. Oh, boy. So we had a great deal of oh, fun. Oh, well, thank and you. And I was always looking, and you had that long, beautiful braid, and it was just, I mean, I walk in the airport, and I just, oh. <laughs> it's you so were, nice you, to have an you, admirer. You were, you were wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Larry. I'm so glad you came today. I definitely have to get rid of this leather jacket because, you know, since it's August and everything, I did it for effect more than anything. Okay, thank you. Well, that was a great story, and thank you for um, stating how, how... I think it just goes to show that my stickling about being particular about everything was a good trait to have when you're a pilot. Um, because we know of different situations even that we hear where the pilots lose track of the instruments, don't trust the instruments, and that's one of the things that'll get you get you in big trouble in a, in a plane real fast. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, going on then with my story, I, and I, I really am very excited. I think I, Bill Willard said he t went for a ride with me one time on a plane. So it's really fun that a few people at least actually had firsthand experiences, and I enjoy remembering those times with those people. On December 7, 1941, almost everybody remembers that date, even people that are much younger than um, people that are here. And it was such a dark day, as our president, uh, FDR, said. It was a day that lived in infamy, infamy. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, a civil air patrol was organized. And due to the fact that there weren't a large number of pilots in the country anyway, uh, women pilots were welcomed into this organization. Of course, they had to meet the same standards of the men, and uh, that was, I think, piloting was one of the one of the ways that women could do that. Pretty, pretty much so. Some of the jobs that the women performed in this service were towing targets for anti-aircraft practice. Okay, volunteers. It's like the javelin catcher in the Olympics. You know, you don't want that job. Uh, flying engineering test flights. We flew the big B-29s and we flew simulated strafing missions. In the first year of activity, the women set a new safety record in military avi aviation of only one fatal accident for every three million miles flown, which I think is pretty impressive, probably even today. In May of 1942, I applied to the ferrying division, a new group made up entirely of women because the men had all been called up for active duty. And farriers were the people who took the planes from the Midwest, where they were manufactured or wherever they were manufactured, to either the East Coast or on to Britain and to um, uh, Europe for active duty. Uh, in order to apply, I had to have at least 500 hours of flight experience, have a horsepower rating of 0 to 200, a high school education, be a native-born U.S. citizen, and between the ages of 21 and 35. Well, I was 28 and I had a horsepower rating of zero to 265, and I had over 2,000 hours in the air. So obviously I was well qualified for the position and I was very delighted when I was selected to be a part of it. In September 11th of that year, uh, I was called to serve in the second ferrying group of the Air Transport, Transport Command in Wilmington, Delaware. This group flew planes, as I said, and at some point, I can't remember exactly when, but I was transferred back to Indiana but I was made commander of the squadron number five of the Indiana Civil Air Patrol. We had 20 planes, 
And according to the article in the New Sent Sentinel in December of 1943, 35 cadets were here at the airport doing intensive drills and maneuvers here at the airport, and the War Department directives were here. Six new hangars were being built in a matter of just three weeks. I don't know what could be built in three weeks anymore. <laughs> we even managed, um, as, a, as a special uh, point of interest too, I was not the only 99 that did this. There were many other 99s who did this same kind of service for our country during this time. They trained Army and Navy cadets on civilian pilot training and war training. This helped in building a great reserve of pilots for the country. It also helped dispel the misconception that you had to have great strength to be a pilot. Thank heavens our expertise was appreciated at this important time in history. We even managed to have some meetings during those years, the 99s. April of 1944, uh, somebody sent a letter saying I couldn't attend <clears throat> because my last instructor had been already entered the Navy and I was busy training others to fly here in my neck of the woods, as I would say. It kept me busy enough that I did, couldn't even go see my husband Wayne in Fairfax Field, Kansas. In October of 44, we had a meeting right here in Rochester, and I regaled the girls with my tales of early flying. You see, a lot of these girls didn't start flying until the last five years or so. And so I had been flying since I was obviously even a teenager. So they loved that. We had a great time dancing at the open air floor at the Colonial out on Lake Manitoba. And the next morning, on Sunday morning, I woke them all up by buzzing the lake. One of my favorite things to do. <laughs> Probably in Susabella, I would imagine. After, the, way, after uh, the war, Wayne and I ran pilot school instructions and maintained a flying service here for businessmen and others in northern Indiana. One of my protégés, Peggy Trout, shared the good news of ours being one of the few Indiana airports receiving the Good Airport Operating per, uh, Practice Certificate in 1947. This is awarded once a year for meeting the highest standard for safe operation. In addition, we received our Air Agency Certificate, making us an approved flying school. She also shared that we had very great concern about our 24 runway lights. They caused the greatest excitement about town when the first night of flying, the residents kept calling, saying, asking if we had gotten the plane down that was having so much trouble. Our only comment was, it's just some students practicing. Peggy also added with great pride and joy that we had newly acquired, and this could have been the one you were talking about, 450 horsepower negative sta staggered beach craft. She described it as, quote, a five place job with a plenty of oomph. That's 180 miles an hour cruising speed. Quite something for that day and age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was beachcraft. Sadly, though, the fates determined that I was not to live a long life. The week of September 13, 1954, my husband Wayne had flown lo local businessman Bryce Burton up to northern Michigan for the week. While he was gone, I became ill and passed away. According to coroner Dean K. Stinson, I had suffered an embolism of the lung. Although Bryce was informed of my demise, he was asked not to inform my husband until after they returned to Rochester that day. I was only 40 years old, but despite this, I feel my contribution to the Rochester airport, the American war effort, and women's aviation in general has made for a very interesting legacy here in Fulton County and beyond. And I'm greatly honored to have been a part of this tour today. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, oh we've got one more story, I love it. From my, from my ma admirer. Oh, yes. <laughs> my dad would be, we would be driving along and he'd just pass out in the car and mom would grab the wheel. This happened several times. And my grandfather died in 44 of a massive heart attack. Hmm. So my grandmother sent him to Mayo's. He was gone for a week. We picked him up at the train station in South Bend and we were driving back. We get into Rochester and he says, I think I'll stop at the airport. My mom looked at what? <laughs> we go into the airport. We sat down and he said, uh, can I talk to someone that teaches flying and it was you so we sat down at the table and he said i want to learn to fly and my mom you could pick her off of the <laughs> off of the ceiling things you don't expect to hear on returning and from the doctor <laughs> so after they talked for a long time and and you could notice mom was very irritated by this I, whole process. she was very upset and, uh, as i recall she said at least i can grab the steering wheel and pull the car of course there was nothing to, in the, in the yeah. old car you could just slide over and get it yeah. what do i do if something happens in the airplane so the deal was you were going to teach my mom how to land. Oh. 
Mom could land. It was nothing you wanted to see. It was not pretty. But she got the plane down out of the air. She, I think you had five or six deals. So, so Dad took his lesson. What he found out at Mayo is he needed a hobby. Oh. Stress was what was causing his problems. Oh. And so after we got through flying, we put a runway out at the farm, and we bought us a, a cub. Mm -hmm. And every day, Dad would fly for a half hour or so. We'd check the cattle, check everything on the farm. Oh, my. Never had a problem after that. <laughs> And we flew all over the country, and we had a great deal of time. And it was all because of what you did. Wow. And you satisfied my mom so she would fly with him. Very good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very That's much. 19, probably 48, 47, Okay, all right, probably. Okay, how thank you again. People, how many people here flew with Helen House? Okay. So three, four? Very good. Okay. Well, I want your autographs so I can take them back with me and show my friends in heaven. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. This is great. We're going to our next stop, and we're going to walk down the grassway over to the man in the black suit, who is the mayor. Okay. Now we're, um, we're here at the grave of Henry Barnhart, and Mayor Ted Denton will portray Henry for us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. Welcome to the Barnhart section of uh, the IOOF Cemetery. Uh, first of all, do you know what's nice about being a, an ex-congressman who's passed away? What's nice about that? You need no secret service. <laughs> so we're saving you money today. Well, welcome. Welcome. And I see Mr. Kendi right there at that shirt tail relative of mine. Say, I have a bone to pick with you. Look down the line here. We've got uh, Heidi, Boswell, McMahon. Look how large their stone is, and then look at mine. We're going to talk. We're going to talk. Well, clear on the other end, yes. Well, there, my family is located here. We've got uh, Ott here on the end, and lovely Martha, and we've got my lovely Loretta, and myself. And yes, I've been gone for uh, almost 80 years. Uh, it's nice to be out here amongst the people because uh, I've only been out here for about 40 years. I started out in the mausoleum that used to be over there. Do you all, any of you remember the mausoleum? Yes. Okay. Uh, did not like that. That shut me off from all the people, and I was a man that was definitely... A man of the people. Starting out uh, humble beginnings, I was born on a farm, 12 mile, and by the way, back in those days, we referred to it as henpeck. Did anybody know that? Really? Shirley, where's Shirley? Did you know it was no called henpeck back in those days? Yes, yes, and then the name was changed to 12 mile. But anyway, and uh, the thinking back then was it's 12 miles because it's 12 miles from Peru, it's 12 miles from Logan Sport, and it's 12 miles from Rochester, which wasn't true. But that's what everybody thought. So that's where I was born, on a farm. And then gravitated into Rochester. And as many of you know, I didn't start the newspaper, but I bought it in the early days and became one of the first editors. Now, I stopped by to pick up that wonderful periodical before I came out here today, and wow, we were just one page back in those days. And this paper, by itself, sells for 75 cents. That's what I made in a week. <laughs> anyway, that was my great, great pleasure to be, be a newspaper man, because that was really in my blood and uh, stayed with me throughout my days. I loved to be amongst the people, converse with the people, tell stories. Uh, John Troutman was one of my best friends in town. We'd sit and fish. And all we do is tell stories about the community. I also uh, got involved a little later down the line and uh, started the Rochester Telephone Company, first president of the telephone company. And again, it was all about communication all about getting out and telling people things, letting them know what was going on. Back in those days, we didn't have any Chamber of Commerce. We had uh, the Kiwanis Club. Some of you may not know this, but uh, the Kiwanis Club was charged 
with a lot of the duties that the current chamber takes care of. Going out promoting the community, getting people to come, and I was very involved in that, even to the point that when I did go to Congress, I used my influence and help through the Kiwanis to bring the fish hatcheries to Rochester, which uh, did us a lot of good. It put us on the map uh, in the federal eyes, and brought some uh, resources that we had not had before to our community. I also uh, was highly involved in the Isaac Walton League and again, another group that was promoting the community. So we had a whole community involved in making things happen. And then about 1909, after I had worked in some other positions, I served some time for a while as, a, I shouldn't say time, that's a bad thing to say. I was a director for three years, at Michigan City Prison. Didn't really serve time, I worked there. And uh, then uh, I also was a trustee uh, for Longcliffe, Longcliffe uh, Sanitarium for about uh, uh, eight or nine years. Uh, again, all in the people business, being around people. And then in 1909, one of my Democrat colleagues in Congress couldn't finish his four-year term, and the party got together and caucused and made me the U.S. congressman to serve the next three years and go to Washington to serve our district, which I was very proud to be a part of. And I carried forth the same old good old boy habits that I picked up in my upbringing in Rochester. Talk to everybody. Didn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat. You sit down and you talk. Matter of fact, I got to be very good friends with a fellow who was uh, across the way in the Senate from Ohio who was a good old boy too by the name of Warren Harding. And uh, Hardy and I, oh, we'd sit and we'd have a little uh, little snifter of brandy and a cigar. And by the way, we can't have cigars in heaven, so that's why I don't have one today. Do you know that's a no-smoking zone there? <laughs> Go figure. I asked the Lord. I said, why can't I have my stogie in heaven? Well, he says, don't you know those are bad for you? I said, in your point. So anyway, we, we, we've all quit smoking up there. We have no cigars, no pipes, nothing. So anyway, but down here on earth, Hardy and I would sit and have many, many discussions, come together on many things that would uh, benefit both, both parties and also cross not only party lines, but uh, the Congress and the Senate. We pull, pull, try to pull things together. Down around 1919, when uh, Woody Wilson was president, we had a big, big, big uproar in the, in the uh, country. It was called the Suffragette Movement, and the 19th Amendment was on the plate to give the women the right to vote. Can you imagine women voting? A lot of people were aghast. Well, I didn't think that way. Like I said, I'd grown up on a farm on 12 Mile with a mother that I thought was just wonderful and I thought was the wisest person I ever knew. Beautiful Loretta, I confided in her a lot. She had some very, very good opinions. And I was under the opinion that, you know, this world is pretty rough and hard with everything going on today. We really need the influence of the other gender to help us become a better world. So that is where I was coming from. And I'm happy to say that uh, President Wilson, he was of that uh, same opinion. So there were many of us working hard to that end. Now, it came into Congress a couple of times and was defeated. And then finally in March of 1919, came to the floor of the Congress. And I was not feeling well at that time. I was under the weather. I was actually in a hospital bed, quite ill. And I asked to be rolled into the floor of Congress in my hospital bed so I could vote for the 19th Amendment. Right. Well, I am proud to say it carried. And then through efforts of my friend Woody over in the Senate, 
it carried in the Senate, and women got the right to vote, which we're very, very proud of. I think it probably wasn't something that did me a lot of good in the end, I'm sorry to say, but I'm very proud of it, because in 1920 then I was defeated, uh, didn't get uh, another term in office, but that's all right. We had accomplished something very, very important. So then, you know, after my experience, 11 years in Congress, came back home and took up uh, the role of a uh, Rochester resident and again uh, uh, helped to move things along in our community, but spent a lot of time on the farm uh, raising cattle, nice Guernsey cattle, and I got to speak quite a bit. So that was, that was a plus because we could go around talking about not only the topics of the day, but the things that uh, were very important that got us where we were at that time. And then we came down to the culmination of my, uh, my life, my tenure, and I have no regrets. I had 75 years of a very colorful, uh, a very exciting, a very rewarding life. And I had a great family. Those of you, uh, some of you still probably remember uh, Ott, my son, and Martha. Uh, if you go out and watch football games some night, you'll notice that their Barnhart Field was named for Otto and Martha. And I'm very, very proud of that. We're still uh, a presence in the community. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that I was a good Baptist. And when I did pass, I had over 800 people attend my funeral. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it makes me very humble to know that uh, that was the turnout. It, when you look down and you see something like that, uh, you say you must have been a, a good servant. Uh, we had uh, not only uh, the, the, the locals there that I dearly loved and, and uh, loved to talk and cherish, but we had uh, 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 President or uh, Governor Paul uh, McNutt there. He, he said a few words in Rochester at my uh, funeral. And we had a nice, nice message from Vice President John Garner at that time. And Garner said something I will never forget. He said, you know, people come and go in Congress all the time, but ones like Henry Barnhart will never be forgotten. And I've taken that really to heart and, and really appreciated that. Now, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, the fact that we used to sit around and tell lots of stories in Congress. There's one that all of my colleagues asked me to repeat time and time again. So I'm going to close with this because it is kind of a funny story, or we thought so. They'd say, tell the story about the young lawyer in Fulton County. Tell the story about the lawyer in Fulton County. Now, you got to remember, back then, we didn't have a lot of lawyers around us, okay? We came from all different walks of life. It wasn't just all lawyers in Congress. So I told the story about the young, ambitious lawyer in Fulton County who was in circuit court and de defending uh, a farmer who had sold another farmer a jackass. And the jackass, well, he died shortly after the fella sold this to the other farmer. And the other farmer was claiming he'd been sold a diseased jackass. This young lawyer got up and gave his summation to the jury, and he said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that jackass was perfectly fine. This farmer over here put him in a field right next to several young mares, and the jackass kept trying his best to break down the barbed wire fence to get in with those mares. He didn't die of disease, he died of a broken heart. <laughs> the farmer was acquitted. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now you're going to, uh, thank you. And now they're gonna go see uh, Maggie, right? Yes, they're gonna go see Maud. Or um, Maud, I'm Maud, sorry. Maud, yes. Really, all you'll have to do is just turn around and, and you'll see uh, Maud over there with her orange flag. And we'll be over there in a minute with the speaker. Thank you.
Henry. <laughs> this, this lovely lady is Maud Emmons, Maud Montgomery Emmons, and she's portrayed today by Maria Kelsey. Thank you. And welcome. I am so embarrassed. I have to apologize before I do anything else. My mother taught me as a child that a lady never leaves the house without a hat and gloves, and I left my gloves at home. I'm horrified, so forgive me. Um, so, uh, let me introduce myself a little more formally. I was born here in this county, in Fulton County, in 1881. I had a lovely childhood. I grew up on a farm out near Talma. And wonderful life with my two sisters. I really can't think of anything terrible about growing up in, in rural Indiana, except for one thing. When I was 16, I was taking my buggy into town and we had a new horse. Well, he wasn't a new horse. He was just a new horse to us. And he was a little frisky. But I knew I could handle this horse. So we were coming into town, and something must have spooked him. Before you know it, we're going down the road. I bet we were going 40 miles an hour. I thought I was going to die. I lost my hat. My mother was furious. I thought I was going to fall off. It was horrifying. You may laugh, but my hair turned white. And really? You don't think that happens, but it did. And I was so embarrassed, I mean, I was only 16, I died it from that day on. Does that seem surprising to you from in that time period? So um, after s school, I went to Rochester Normal College, right here in Rochester, and got a professional teacher's certificate. And from there, I went to teaching in Richland Center and in Talma. I was um, pretty young, 21 years old, and some of the students, especially the boys, were bigger than I and stronger than I, and I really think several of them were older than I. <laughs> but I did the best I could, and I enjoyed teaching. I liked it very, very much. Then I met Charles. He was so wonderful. He was just a wonderful man. He was an attorney, and we married. Uh, April 22nd, no, I can't remember my marriage date, but I do know that April 22nd these days is Earth Day, so isn't that a nice thing? 1911. Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> isn't it wonderful that you know and I don't? <laughs> well, Charles always remembered. That's the important thing. Um, so we were so happy. We lived first in... Rochester on Pontiac, actually across the street from where Caroline Jones lives now. It was on the corner of Pontiac and 10th, 10th Street, I forget the address. But it, the house is still there, it's just not white anymore. Then we bought a farm out in the country and um, built a beautiful big house out there and it was lovely. Um, I worked for the women's suffrage movement, and Charles was behind me 100%. I traveled all over the state and Illinois talking to people about how women deserved the right to vote. And Mr. Um, Barnhart may have told you about how he was supportive of women's suffrage. It was so unbelievable to us that people could love their parents and love their mothers and respect their wives and still not see that they deserve to have a vote. And of course, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, and I hope all of you women vote every chance you get. Twice, if you can. <laughs> no harm. So um, let me think. It was just, it was a wonderful, wonderful marriage. Um, it was an interesting time to live. You know, I was born in 1881. In the time that I was growing up, we got the automobile, the telephone, um, airplanes, um, all kinds of advances in medicine. However, unfortunately, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we couldn't have children. It's strange how things work out, though, because at one point, a family moved in next to us, the Clay family, who had quite a few children, and we sort of took them in under our wing, especially little Margaret. She was the sweetest little girl, 
and we would have her come over every weekend. I bought her a little outfit, and Charlie was crazy about her. He would take her fishing. They would come back filthy. They would go into town, and I would say, don't go to, I won't remember the name of the place now, but it was a bar. <laughs> what was it? Belts' cigar, cigar store, and he would take her in there and put her up on a stool. I don't think he served her anything, but they were, they were buddies. They had, and you know the wonderful thing about it is that Margaret and I were friends till the, for my entire life. I miss that little girl, and she's I think 91 years old now. Um, let's see what else. I worked during World War One, of course, selling war bonds, and. Um, in fact, there was a women's defense committee that was organized, and I was um, the chairman of it. We worked very, very hard, and in fact, I got a letter from the president thanking me for selling so many war bonds. And now, how many of you can think who that president would have been? This was World War I. I hope so. I have no idea. <laughs> was a long time ago. <laughs> so um, after my husband died, I, um, I had to support myself. And so um, it's interesting, you know, we got through the depression and we did all right. He was a good lawyer. Um, he was a kind man. So very often he worked for no pay. And I think probably we spent a little bit more than we saved. So when he was gone, I had to work, but I always loved doing needlework. And so I went to work at the hospital, stitching things together and making things that they needed at the hospital. You remember where the old hospital was? Anybody, anybody? Good. I didn't know where it was until I asked somebody, what was where the library is before the library was there? And that's what it was. And I'm um, sure I'm forgetting important things, so why don't you ask me some questions? Have you visited Margaret Burkett lately? I have. She's a charming woman. Charming woman. I think she would be here, except she's blind, and she doesn't go out too often. She talked a lot about Margaret Burkett, who was five when I met her, who's now 91, talked to me about me. <laughs> she was very interesting. Should I talk about the suffragettes at all? We were, we were sophisticated and we were calm, but we could be quite the wild bunch. We were willing to be put in jail. We were willing to be, we weren't like Mrs. Pankhurst. We never chained ourselves to anything, but we worked hard and we were proud of it. And now everyone here, including the women, can vote. Okay, thank you. Bob Peterson has something to say. I'd like to say that I was personally acquainted with Maud Montgomery. My father had worked for the Montgomerys when he was a young man and lived with them. Their farm was about a mile north of our farm out in Newcastle Township. Uh, I got acquainted with them uh, pretty much after uh, Maud had married Charlie Emmons and he later had the farm. But Maud was a very classy lady, always dressed very well, always wore a hat, and, uh, and uh, she was much of a contrast to others in the community. Uh, Charlie Emmons was a successful lawyer. He, uh, I have to tell this story on him, he uh, liked to brag about all the sports events. He'd been to the Kentucky Derby and he'd been to World Series. And he used to tell the story that he went to the Lewis Schmeling fight and he got up to take his coat off, and that was when Lewis knocked Schmeling down, and he missed it. <laughs> we never knew whether that was just a story. But uh, Maud was a classy lady, and yes, uh, the Clays lived on the farm. Uh, Margaret and uh, Maud and Charlie just almost uh, adopted her as a foster child. And uh, the one thing I remember was that uh, Maud and Charlie took uh, Max Clay, her brother, Red Morris, and I, to the pony races, the state fair at a time when we were probably 12, 14 years old. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. 
Shirley Willard from uh, the Fulton County Historical Society has a couple things she'd like to say. Thank you. Uh, interesting, two of these uh, families had round barns. The Gosses had a round barn over at Athens uh, called Owl Creek. And then um, Maud's family, the Montgomery's, had a round barn uh, west of Rochester. Uh, I think Ted got his tongue tangled a little bit. It was uh, um, Hugh McMahon, not Ott. Hugh Barnhart. There, I'm getting my tongue tangled. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to invite all of you to come. We're having a Civil War program at the museum. Not this next week, August 20th. We've postponed it to October 22nd. Nancy Baxter has written a new book about Indiana in the Civil War, and it has several Fulton County people in it. So she's going to be at the Fulton County Museum uh, October 22nd to give a program about it and about those who were in Andersonville Prison. So I wanted to invite you all to that. Uh, do you have anything more, Caroline? Thank you, thank you, okay, thanks everybody for coming and come visit the museum. And the uh, Trail of Courage is coming up in September, so hope you all come out. Thank you.